Well, hello there, everyone. Coach here. How you doing? How you dealing with uh, the first week of spring coming in this week? I hope you have a, a good weather pattern right now. Some of you I know are washed away. Some of you are buried in snow, and I hope everything's good there. But you know, spring will be here for everybody at various times soon enough. Many of you probably get into the spring cleaning bug mode for the inside of your home. Time to reorganize, clean up, reduce clutter, that kind of stuff. But there are also many, but I'm only going to list six or so, spring tasks that the landscape should receive as well. Hey, welcome again. I'm glad you're here. Let's get going with my top six. Boy, I tell you what, I can remember my mama. Man, that woman, she almost loved, she almost looked forward to diving in to spring cleaning every year. And you know what, you know, as young kids, my brother and I, man, we would try to get away from it, get outside, and man, never. Uh-uh, uh-uh. We got pulled into that cleaning tornado every single year. And you know, as we grew older, we just kind of came to expect it. But when you're young, you know, you wanted to be outside playing. Heck, we were at school all day, and now we had to be home to do what? Uh, clean under the bed? You know what I'm saying. You know, dusting and deep cleaning, carpet shampooed, glass inside and out, clothes went to the goodwill. I mean, it went on and on and on. And we always, um, most usually, lost at least a whole weekend. And that lady had a punch list. Oh my God, it looked like Santa's list most of the time. But I'll tell you what, we never really did much outside to the landscape, <laughs> ever. My folks were just not landscape-minded people at all. I was raised on a small horse ranch, so outside meant cleaning stalls and hanging hay nets and, you know, occasionally mowing weeds and, yeah, the, you know, I grew up on a small two and a half acres and only about an acre and a half was usable. And I'll tell you what, it was a horse ranch. It, it wasn't an ornamental uh, landscape, architectural digest type of landscape whatsoever. But you know, as I got older, I got educated and learned more things about landscape wise. And I learned there is definitely spring tasks there as well, not just on the inside, but on the outside. And doing these tasks, as I learned, greatly improve the health and beauty of your landscape. Now, there are really many, many more than just six. And if I listed 25 of them, my God, we'd be here for three hours. So I'm just going to do six with maybe a bonus. But these will get you started, and maybe as you get into it, you'll find more things that need your attention along the way. You know, in no particular order of importance, let's take a look at them, shall we? All right, let's take a look at number six, since we're going to count down. Number six to me is turf care or lawn care. You know, winters can be they can just be brutal. They can be very, very hard on your prized green carpet out there. And soon into spring, you should be greeting that sleepy lawn with a little bit of little TLC. You know, try some of these tasks to really reinvigorate a sleepy turf back to life. If you haven't heard it or you haven't watched it, check out my 412 video on lawn care. Uh, it's a real eye-opener as far as how much you can really look into your lawn and beautify it without a whole lot of investment, time, and effort. But our first thing I would suggest, at least every other year, and that is aeration. If it's been more than two years, hmm, or ever for some of you, this task can, is great, absolutely fantastic for opening up compacted lawn soil beds, introducing air and deeper water penetration and nutrients. You know, as a bonus, when you get done with the aeration, a bonus top dress the lawn with a quality weed-free compost is an excellent way to finish it off with a good spring feeding of your favorite lawn fertilizer. Another thing you can do in conjunction with all this is reseed. Reseed bare spots or the whole damn yard if it looks like it needs it. You know, between dog kill, rodent mounds, diseases, too much shade, not enough water, lawns can really get stressed. Coming out of winter dormancy, many times they'll 
thrive in some areas and be weak in other areas, and we want it to look consistently beautiful from one end to the other. And you know what to do. It's just a matter of effort. That's all it really is. Now, for most of you, you might have to wait a few more weeks because uh, even though the calendar says spring, Mother Nature says, ah, uh, ah, uh, uh, not just yet. You might have to wait until you have those warm days, cool nights, and frost-free nights, most importantly. All right, number five, weeds. <laughs> favorite topic of a lot of people. Many weeds, despite our best efforts, just appear in springtime when you didn't see them last fall or you didn't see them in the winter, especially if you got snow cover. And then all of a sudden, where in that Sam hell did those come from? Well, my approach to weeds is get them early, get them often, period. Now here's something that a lot of people make a mistake and that is they rototill. They rototill new beds or a new veggie garden, and they don't understand that six weeks later, they're just super infested. Remember when you rototill, you take dormant seed that can't germinate six or eight inches down under the ground, and you rototill it up to the surface. You've turned that turf or that soil over, and now you've given that dormant seed that's been sitting there for maybe years and years and years, the opportunity to have light, water, and food. The golden triangle of weed emergence, and here you go. But if you jump on it, you jump on it early before they get really established, weed control can be fairly simple and awfully quick as well. Controls can come from a couple of different sources, and I know I'm gonna get feedback on this. I don't really care anymore. Controls can come from manual sources. You can hand pull them. You can use tools like a hula hoe or a regular hoe. You can have a weed pulling party like I used to do with my kids. You know, we'd get out there and start pulling weeds and stuff by hand. And once we got a big area taken care of, it was hot dogs and hamburgers for lunch type of thing. So get the whole fam family in on it. I know many of you are averse to chemicals. I get it, okay? You've said it loud and clear, I get it. Your yard will be taken care of manually. But for some of us who have bigger places and absolutely don't have the time nor the inclination, there are translocative type of herbicides out there that will get rid of weeds in the areas that you don't want them. You know, translocative contact herbicides. You can even gently use in between ornamentals. And as long as you don't get it on your ornamentals, it'll take care of the weeds. Generally, it's a Band-Aid. It's a Band-Aid on a surgical need. And oftentimes, once you get them sprayed, come back in with a nice thick layer of mulch. So you retard and reduce the propagation of new seed coming up again really, really quick. Number four is pruning. Wait, coach, isn't pruning generally done in winter and, and fall? Well, yeah, in some cases, yes. But after some brutal winters, and can many of you tell me uh, a worse winter than we have gone through and are some cases still going through of 22 and 23. Holy crap. Why don't you ask some people in the mountainous areas of California and the Pacific Northwest and the Rocky Mountains? Holy crap. Brutal winter weather, trees and tall shrubs can be just beaten to hell with snow load and wind damage, etc. So go out there and inspect and do some pruning of some of the snapped off snow load branches that are there. You don't wanna weaken the tree and introduce disease and stuff. So get out there and prune and clean those things up and make sure that they're back to a strong, healthy appearance. Cut those and make those cuts. Come back to about a quarter to a half inch of the branch collar, etc. So they'll heal up properly. Take a look at some of the YouTube videos on how to remove branches so you don't end off with big snap-offs as that big branch comes down. You know, do an undercut and then do a cutout away from that undercut. So when it does break, it breaks at the undercut and then you can come back and make a nice clean, clean finish cut on it. And you don't necessarily need to put anything on the cut itself. Mother Nature knows how to repair her own owies and she'll come back and seal that thing off on her own. 
hey, if you didn't shape up shrubs last fall, now is a good time for many to get out there and give things a small haircut. They'll flush out really fast during this time of year, especially before the heat of the summer sets in. Be mindful of how much you remove, no more than 20 to 30% at most in any one clipping, sometimes even less depending on the plant variety. Now, moving on to number three. Number three is a touchy one because not everybody has it, but some of you do out there. And that is Varmint Kong. Bill Murray said it best, Varmint Kong. These pesky little bastards, these guys can flat decimate a valuable landscape if they get established. At first sign, at first sign, get on them quick because they reproduce at alarming, alarming rates. So those little guys, those furry little burrowing rodents, gophers, moles, voles, ground squirrels, they need to be dealt with or you will have an ugly, very ugly, unsafe and unproductive yard pretty quick. In addition to those guys, think about things like bees and wasps. Now, productive honeybees, okay, most of us can live with those, you know, unless you're highly allergic to them. But most honeybees, man, if you're not bothering them or you don't step on them, you know, like a lot of people do with clover lawns, they're never going to hurt you. Now, with the exception of the African honeybee, the ones that kind of had invaded the southwest part of the United States, thank you South America, those guys there, they're pretty aggressive. And now I understand the new, uh, what are they, murder hornets, thank you the Orient, that have come into the Pacific Northwest with, these things are as big as my damn thumb practically, and they're taking on and killing off native bees and stuff. All of these guys, the, the pesty type of insect needs to be dealt with and you need to get on it and probably at a professional level once discovered. Don't let it get out of control or ah, I'll get to it next month. Na 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 na, na 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 na. You know me well enough, don't procrastinate. It's gonna cost you a lot more and it's gonna be that much more unsafe and ugly out there if you procrastinate. Now, back on rodents for just a second. I got a little experience in this, but I'm not gonna over talk it. The rodent controls and the removal processes are varied and there's, there's quite a few. For me and what I've been exposed to, both personally and professionally, most are a gimmick, most are a joke. They may be okay in a very controlled testing type of setting, but the old ways are the best ways. That's what I've found. So I even watched, as far as burrowing rodents, I watched a very creative video yesterday when I was doing some research about this topic and it was controlling burrowing rabbits. You know, they were out there in the, in the horse field creating these very unsafe tunnels and holes where horses could snap their, their fetlocks and their legs. So they hired a pro. What did that pro bring in? Get this, trained ferrets, trained ferrets. They had trained their ferrets with a radio beacon attached to them to go down into these rabbit holes and chase these freaking rabbits right scurrying right up out of their hole and into a net where the humans would come over and control the rabbits in the net put them in a box and they would be relocated or rabbit stew. I don't know what they did with them. Talk about creative. But the old ways as far as moles, voles, gophers especially, what I found in my experience with gopher traps is basically dealing with the rodent in the tunnel and not trying to gas it, not try to bait it. Secondary kills of various things that start affecting the predator aspect of it. I'm not a fan of, so I'd prefer to deal with just the gopher and deal with the gopher in the, in the tunnel. So the traps have been the best thing that I've used. The, the gopher hawk and some of the old green or metal spring traps that you place down in the tunnel. I think they used to be called Mackie traps, but I know they're put out by Victor and some other, other makers now. Uh, you can look into those as well. I'm not supported or sponsored by any of them. It's just that those are the ones that I found that work the best. 
And yeah, it does take a little bit of work. I mean, you got to excavate a hole and find the tunnel and place the trap and string the trap and then gently rebury your digging and, you know, hope for the best. But that's really all you can do, but you have to be persistent and you have to stay with it. Uh, many times those traps, just like mouse traps, people put them out and they kind of forget about them. And you really should be checking on them once a day if you have traps out. I, I can remember many times being on... Uh, my ranch and man we had we had mice occasionally and there was no better sound than when we were trying to fall asleep and we had put a couple of little mouse traps out and we heard the snap and we both spring spring from bed going yes and we go there and dispose of the mouse so stay on them be persistent i'll share a quick story with you i loved this pet Years and years ago, my family used to have a cat by the name of Pumpkin. Pumpkin, don't associate it with the color of the cat. It was not an orange cat at all. But it was a fantastic hunter of mice and gopher. Holy crap, this cat could hunt. And she, on no less than once or twice a week, would be bringing a mouse or a gopher during the season up to the back family slider, literally throwing it against the window to get our attention to say, hey, check out what I'm doing for you. That cat, I'll bet you in the time that she was alive, she probably caught, I'm going to say 500 mice and gophers easily. You know, she was just a fantastic controller. And you know what? We were, our property backed up to, um, farmland and empty land so back there there was a lot of gopher uh, transference from the agricultural side they would come under the fence and into the yard and then the the field that was back there undisturbed had a lot of mice and this cat just had a field day she we never really had mice in and a couple gophers that were there she would sit there for freaking hours staring at that gopher and as soon as it popped up boom it was over. It was done with. It was a beauty thing to watch. So, a good, well-trained cat. Or maybe go buy yourself a ferret and train it. <laughs> hey, number two, bed prep and beautification. A big one. You know, from going to the nursery on that Saturday morning when all the new fresh stock is in, all the new colors and everything. What a glorious time to be in the nursery industry back then. But for you, new annuals, Maybe finding some, and now's the time to find them, summer bulbs. Spring is the time to get some of these things at home and get some lipstick on that winter pig of a landscape and make things look fresh, look new, vibrant for not just now, but for months. It's only going to get better. Remember a new layer of mulch after you get all that planting done. Put a nice new layer of mulch over it. Make it look brand spanking new. That's a great way to feel good about a spring landscape. These efforts, these efforts coupled with lawn spruce up can really make an eye popper in a very short period of time, in a weekend, you know, with not an extravagant cost and just your time expended. You know, you can go out and hire somebody, but you know, why are you listening to me then? Just go write a check all the time. Remember when you're doing your annuals, your bulbs, your plantings, etc. Remember things as far as blooming periods, contrasting leaf and flower colors, talls in the back of the bed, shorts in the front of the bed, and try to protract it out. Look for a long blooming periods and plant them, stagger the planting so they, they come up and you have color from maybe now until Halloween. Hey, moving on to our last one, diseases. Dormant throughout most of the winter, Many plant and turf diseases can really rear their ugly heads in the springtime. Those longer days, warming temps, breezy, cooler nights, and moist, humid air can be a signal to literally release the kraken of landscape diseases and bugs. It really can be. You know, you get things like, uh, oh, I don't know, a real common one that people can't stand and they really don't know what to do because it's more of a, a preventative measure rather than a reactive measure. And that's things like peach leaf curl. You know, winter treatments are usually the order of the day for that. 
you have to get rid of the spores and stuff that come along with peach leaf curl around the ground in the crotches of the peach tree or peach bush uh, long before blooming and certainly long before leaf out. But you can spray a mild copper base spray up to about popcorn stage of your bloom. And then you gotta stop if you wanna have any chance of you know, a harvest. And then after the bloom is off, you can, and the leafing out when the peach leaf curl really ends up with it. Uh, there are some, I think Bonide puts it out. You might wanna look into that because uh, it's safe to use after leaf out. Uh, check that. And as far as turf diseases, I mean, you get a lot of things like rust, especially with a bluegrass mix or a bluegrass lawn, rust, mildews, molds, brown patch, dollar spot, you know, red thread, all these various funguses and bacterias that can invade into turfs. These are best controlled by keeping your lawn as healthy as possible, as soon as possible when spring bursts forth. Uh, or you can control after infestation with chemical applications and always do it with a, with a fertilizer follow-up. It really is a great way to smack down the disease, but give the turf a chance to reinvigorate itself and come back nicely. Lastly in this is, you know, bugs and pests. Bugs, they can do quite a bit of damage as well. You get things like aphids on rose blooms. I mean, how many times have you seen it? You go out there and you see, oh, next week I'm gonna have my first roses. And you look at the blossom bud and it's just covered, saturated in aphid. Early on, get on it. So aphids, thrips, spider mites, snails, slugs, earwigs, sow bugs, and the list goes on and on. I've always believed, and I've kind of followed this approach, and that is inspect, identify, eradicate to whatever level you choose to eradicate, and then plant or then prune. But get rid of the problem first before you invest more dollars into things in the same area. You don't want to plant a bunch of new whatevers in a place that's infested with gophers. They're just going to come in and chop it right down to the ground. If you have a lot of aphid all over your rose blossom buds, get rid of that first. You know, you can wash them off with water. You can come through with a, a mild neem oil type of thing and spray them and knock them down that way. Or you can use something stronger if you need to. Hey, that's my top six, but let me give you a bonus because I just like to exceed expectations sometimes, plain and simple. My bonus area is irrigation startup. Now, not all of you have an irrigation system, I get it, but there are also quite a few that do. So maybe some of these little tips uh, is a good way to get that irrigation system up and running safely and a little bit of inspection and repair might be needed. The first thing to do, the most simplest thing to do is go out there and find all your sprinkler heads, all of them, especially if they're pop-ups, especially if they're rotor heads or whatever, and clean turf area, mulch area, rock area, whatever it might be, away from the heads so they can operate properly. Then pull up those nozzles. Look at those nozzles, make sure they're in good working order. Remove the nozzle, clean the filters, put them back on, and then when you fire the system up, inspect the nozzles for proper distribution, proper angle, etc. Go to your valve assembly. Inspect those valves for cracks and leaks before you just go flipping on the, the ball valve or the gate valve to full pressure. You might want to turn it on just a little bit and then see if you've got any cracks or leaks coming from the, the valves themselves and act accordingly. You might end up having to replace one or two, especially if they start to get old. And hopefully, hopefully, you know, you winterized them last fall if you're in those zones that need that. Lastly, go to the timers. Check your timers as far as the schedule. This time of year, without a high intense heat, the only thing that you're probably worried about is spring winds. So water accordingly. Water according to what your local rules and regs are too. If you're, if you're still in something of a water conservation area, you probably don't need it more than three times a week at the most. And then adjust up as the months and days 
get longer and get hotter. Hey guys, that's what I had for you this week. Hope you enjoyed it. Hey, you might want to check out next week because we've got another little thing on the website you might be interested in. We have a whole spring and annual checklist for tasks to be done in the landscape itself. It's a great cheat sheet and you should see it this time next week at the latest. Maestro is working it on right now. Hey, don't forget about the ebook if you need to brush up on some landscape education. And if you really want to get on your game, try Homescape 1.0, the digital course. As always, the 15 step is there. I hope you enjoyed this. Check me out over on the YouTube channel and some of the other social medias. Instagram is doing very well lately. And I'd like to thank a special thanks out there to Corey. Corey stepped up for the Homescape 1.0 this past week, and I hope he's getting into it and learning a lot. Thank you, Corey. I appreciate it a lot. As always, guys, to your landscape success, I'll catch you next Friday. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you over on the YouTube channel. Bye for now. Thank you for listening to the Yard Coach Podcast. Don't forget to head over to the website at youryardcoach.com where you will find more DIY landscape education, including the free 15-step DIY landscape checklist, Coach Matt's ebook called Landscaping Simplified, and the flagship digital course, Homescape 1.0. As always, if you have any questions or comments, you can email Coach Matt directly at youryardcoach at gmail.com. We'll see you right here next week.